didn't get the usual. We're recording it on either. Oh, one I didn't. I didn't record on my computer either. <laughs> recording in progress. They said yeah. it to us. Thank you, Alexa. Welcome, stargazers, to the weekly podcast and blog for the Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. Everybody, it's our South Coast Longtime Telescope and Astrophysics Club. Right here in Santa Barbara, it's the SBAU Astro Hour. It's recorded every Monday morning live at 11 a.m. from our respective man caves and computer dens, along with the brain trust of our astronomy club. We try to keep on, on board the latest launches, talk about discovery, space news. There's a lot going on. And this is big number 60, everybody. Episode 60, 60. We've done 59 for April 18th through the 24th. I'm Baron Heron. Today, we're going to talk about Astronomy Day coming in mid-May to Camino Real Marketplace. Tell you about that in a minute. We got a partial pink full moon right now. And my daughter sent me this. I, she saw it online. Neil deGrasse Tyson said, full moon today. This was Saturday over the weekend. First one of since uh, after the March equinox. Sunday following the full moon, he said, is a definition, by definition, Easter. I didn't know that. Yep. This, yeah, this rule, rule precludes solar eclipses from ever taking place on Easter Sunday. Wow. We also have a couple of comments to consider. One meteor shower this week and next. And 5,000 exoplanets found out there so far. That's an announcement from NASA. And I might also throw at you, they just announced, NASA said it's going to use SpaceX for ferrying all future astronauts and visitors up to the International Space Station. No more Russia launches. Wonder why that is. Uh, just as SpaceX launched another project from Canaveral yesterday, a couple days late after the planned blast off Friday the 15th, it was yesterday the 17th, today's the 18th. They really want to clue us in on what the launch was, even though delayed because well, of what? It was, it was from Vandenberg, Ron, and it was a it was. reconnaissance orbiter. Oh, that's right. I saw in the news. They said the, the sonic boom. Did any of you hear the sonic boom? Yeah, yeah absolutely. House shook. House shook. Maybe that was what woke me up. <clears throat> Who knows? Uh, we do uh, silly cartoons of science uh, because they're forwarded to us by our... Well, let me introduce you to the gang, first of all. This is the man who has held the helm of the club for three, going on four. Maybe we're into the fourth year. Jerry Wilson. President, Dr. Wilson. Good morning. I think you own a PhD. His wife is Pat Forge, supporter. Uh, we have our incredible outreach coordinator, Chuck McPartland, been around forever. Chuck, amazing. Good morning. You and Pat, your wife, merchandise manager. And on my screen, Tom Totten, an incredible webmaster, a hardworking man. Thank you, Thomas. You, you, we just couldn't do it without you, I kid you not. Uh, Bruce Murdoch signed in early, got his microphone fixed. And he's also president of the uh, Santa Barbara Theater Organ Society. Bruce, thank you for joining us and supporting us. His wife is Bonnie. Tom Whittemore, former Westmont College science instructor. Morning. Uh, very gourmet baker of bread. Oh, my God, <laughs> that sourdough is so delicious. Editor of our newspaper as well. Shall we go to the sillies? Get that out of the way. Uh, we are missing one of our regular watchers, Tim Crawford, today because of a silly doctor's appointment. None of the rest of us have those, of course. All right. <laughs> Food fight in the science lab. All the uh, researchers are throwing pie. <laughs> mathematicians. All right. Mathematicians are saying food fights. And who the heck is this? This is Erwin Schrodinger, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, his knickers. He's got to be the one on the right, right? That's why nobody yep. talked to him. All right. Didn't get invited to a lot of parties, but he screwed things up with his quantum mechanics. I guess uh, Einstein wasn't big on quantum mechanics. Here we go. Uh, Copernicus was right. The sun, ladies and gentlemen, and the earth are apparently married and share this apartment together. Husband, old Saul, comes home, hangs his coat near the door, and says to his wife, the earth, Look, all I'm saying is I get up every morning and I set the world on fire while you do nothing but sit around on your axis all day. <laughs> humiliated earth wife is thinking, well, everything revolves around him. My God, <laughs> who comes up with me? Is that Larson? That wouldn't be Farsight, I don't guess, would it? No. It's it's Scott Kilburn. Oh, okay. Well, that's really a stretch. 
Uh, this would I get real, be rational. Okay, that would be the pi on one side and the imaginary number on the other, right? <laughs> right. Did you get the uh, high bills one? No, I guess we didn't. Oh, this is the guy. Uh, let's see here. At last, holds up a developing negative in his dark room. I've done it. First real evidence. Oh, yeah, of yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> my own camera in my dark room in my own. And the wife suddenly opens the door. Does that ruin it? Is that the reason that's funny? Yep. Yeah. Okay. And that one's a Larson. Oh, yeah, okay. Definitely. And red light somehow doesn't ruin them. Or is that infrared? Is well, yeah. certainly. Yeah. yeah. Bruce, you have the floor. What do you say? I said certain films are not sensitive to red light. Certain films are. Yeah. But, but the you, ones that aren't, then you can uh, have a, a dim light in your, your photo dark room to uh, to do to, to see things. Can you print red uh, color anyway, you, even though there's red light? Or well, this is when you're doing black and white film. Oh, okay. I used to develop film, and you can also do it in a box with a couple of handheld, you know, places for hand, your gloves go in. So the, it's dark inside the box, but it's not dark outside. So I used to use a four by five speed graphic when I was in high school. I was a high school photographer. And uh, so then you have to load the, the film, uh, whatever they call it, the, the uh, cartridges in the dark, and you have to unload them in the dark. But then you can put them into a, into a, 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 a case that uh, once you've done that, then you can uh, turn the lights on and pour, you just pour the chemicals in to do the development. Well, all you guys- Pour them in and pour them out. All you guys that do astrophotography, you don't do your, be, hello, answer that please. You don't do your own uh, picture developing, do you? We used to back in the film days before CCC would develop. Well, that's, that's what- yeah, You could take whole... ASA 400 film and stretch the ISO up to like 1600. It got kind yeah. of noisy, but- uh... You could push it. Yeah. Well, we got a lot to talk about. Uh, you want to start at the beginning of the talking points, Castor and Pollux, or you want to go to, uh, well, let's say what that uh, launch was again uh, yesterday. What did they put up in the heavens with a SpaceX truck or- It was theory? a reconnaissance satellite. One satellite. I think it was two. Oh. Okay, um, got 5,000 new exo or new planets out there, exoplanets, and we'll talk about that. Talking points about Castor and Pollux. You want to go there, Mr. President? Talk Wherever about. you want, sure. All right, we uh, learned this last week. We want to kind of take it as you laid it out for us. Castor and Pollux, they've got to be Shakespearean characters, I'm sure. It's in Constellation Gemini, the twins, high in the western sky after sunset this week, and it's two brightest stars are Pollux and Castor, known as Alpha Geminorum and Beta Geminorum. Uh, Ge uh, Castor is magnitude 1.6, while Pollux is brighter, magnitude 1.2. Uh, there we are. Looks like a couple of stick figures, doesn't it? Pollux and Castor. Now, if you yeah. use the telescope on this, the um, Castor A and B are several, sec uh, several arc seconds apart. So that's resolvable in most small telescopes. Right, we used that. I, I, I zoned in on that on Friday night at Westmont, third Friday, and people were just, they just loved it. So very easy to split with the eight inch mm -hmm. at about, you know, 70 power. And then there was a, there another, there's other elements too. And I'm sure Chuck, Chuck knows. I was going to say, yeah, it's like a six star system. Yeah, that's right. There's a golden star there. I think it's part of the caster system uh, that everybody really, really liked because of the offset to the, uh, the blue white caster uh, components. There, there it is. In fact, that's exactly what we saw. And that, what that, we saw uh, those two stick figures, that's the Gemini twins. Well, this no. doesn't show the whole ast asterism of Gemini. This just shows right. the caster. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, asterism. he was just referring to what we saw in the telescope uh, on right. Friday at Westmont, Ron. Yeah, okay, well, people was... loved it. They loved it. It was really, really fun. <clears throat> well, you can also see, I believe, see that star in the uh, uh, photo that was attached to Jerry's email. It's up to the upper right of uh, Pollux. There it is. Uh, I don't think that's the same but That's, not, that's oh, okay. definitely not. Yeah. So those are two stick figures. So this yes, is how it are. looks to the naked eye, one. except for the lines. Okay. Uh, the other thing I showed to the folks, and maybe maybe Ch Chuck was working with Tim downstairs with Tim's uh, 102, 
Uh, but another thing I showed folks they really got a kick out of was uh, M35, MS A35, down near the ankle bones of the, of the guy on the right, uh, the twin on the right. Yeah, it looks like a smudge here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was beautiful in the eight inch though. It, despite that full moon, it was really nice. Of the ceiling of the planetarium at the museum, are they are they people? Are they ancient young folks? Standing it's the next twins, to Castor and Pollux. Yeah. I know, but I, all I'm looking, I can't remember how they look. I'm seeing stick figures with tiny little round dot heads. Yeah, Ron, go look Ron, up Stellarium and you get it. Okay. Yeah. Ron, I was, was going to mention that on Friday night, I, I always like to when we when we zone in on the twins. I like to tell the story about, you know, the English used to use Castor and Pollux as navigational stars. And um, of course they are part of Gemini, the twins, but the English would always navigate by Gemini. So that's where that phrase actually came from, by Gemini. Huh. Interesting. Well, okay. And oh, Ron, really? you, okay. you, can, dis you so, can display th these, these figures any way you want in the planetarium. You can put up stick figures or you can put up artistic figures. If you, if you look at the artistic figures, um, every software pattern has a different drawing. There's nothing official about those. It's just people take a drawing and try and fit it. Yeah. And Jerry, oh, uh, he, he, it's clear from the, the, the picture Tom had up there that the, the twins were line dancing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but you say that's an asterism and not a constellation, Mr. Prince? No, the, the same thing. Okay. <laughs> is it Gemini or Gemini? Does Gemini. Well, I say Gemini because my Latin background. Uh huh. Well, there they are. <laughs> they certainly are doing some sort of dance. That's great. All right. Oh, here they are. And where would that be? Uh, uh, is that now? No. What time on the clock on the yearly calendar is Gemini? I get lost on it's that. It's pretty high overhead right now. Yeah. yeah, it's an early evening object. I'm talking and about the month. Who, who are the Gemini babies? When are they born? That's um, that's astrological signs. And that's when the sun is in Gemini. And that right. would be that, But for Jerry, for Jerry and me, we're both you know quote cancers, right, Jerry? Yeah, the sun is actually in Gemini. The sun is in Gemini on our birthdays. Exactly. <laughs> because yeah, because the uh, wow. the, the migration Hot. equinox. Hot. How do you do that? You get all these versions. My God, it's just, I, uh, these are just images that the search engine brings up. Okay, fantastic. Gemini, Gemini. All right. Uh, what? what, what uh, I was born on July 8th. What was your birthday, Tom? 17. July 17. Uh, I think Jerry's is like I had... 30th of June. Jerry, I, I was on okay. 7th of June. Okay. Okay. Uh, about Leo time, I think, isn't it? There was a question I had on a uh, um, midterm in uh, statistics in college, which was how large a group of people do you need to have so there's a 50% chance that two of them have the same birthday? Not a very big group. About a hundred. Twenty-three. Yeah. Twenty-three. Wow. Is that right? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I had that same question. That's crazy. Okay. Well, you know, in the days of slide rules, that wasn't an easy thing to because you what you actually have to do is to calculate the probability that two people do not have the same birthday. Hmm. Well, I don't think. And, I and there are a lot of factorials. You know, you just have to multiply two times three times four times five times, five times six, etc. Mm -hmm. Maybe we ought to do a SVAU calendar with just our pictures. Tom, you want to do that with me again? <laughs> <laughs> when did we do that? 2015 or something? Or 2014? Uh, 20, 2018. 2018, 2018. okay. Back when we had a very young... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go to the moon now. Come back here. To, oh, incidentally, uh, anybody want to update us on uh, the web? I know that's moving ahead, but it's out there and it's topical. And last week we talked about Mars rovers, uh, Opportunity or one of them. But the web is safely wedged in the Lagrange Point 2, still being fine-tuned. The dreaded MI, let's see, infrared imager, MII, is that what it's called? Mid-infrared imager, MIRI. Oh, MIRI, okay. Recently passed through its critical pinch point. What the heck is a pinch point? Cooled, cooled down to just a few Kelvin degrees above absolute zero. Mm -hmm. 
Most of the web is now super cold, less than 50K. He lives behind that big tennis court size sun shield. What is this? Is this before launch? That's a picture of the refrigerator that's used uh, being tested before launch. There's a refrigerator uh, on board the web? Parts of that oh, is. Outer, outer that's space. How you cool it down, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a very thick aluminum frame holding it up. That's not on the spacecraft. But all these <laughs> tubes and, and uh, tubing and, and cylinders or reservoirs and stuff, that's all up there now. And they don't make it cold by just one step. These are stages of, um, of cooling. You have, a, generally in a lab, you have an, an outer doer that, that contains liquid nitrogen that gets down to 77 Kelvin. And then inside that, you could put liquid helium, which gets down to 4.5 Kelvin. And then for things much lower than that, you can pump on the helium uh, being at a low vapor pressure, which a lower, the lowest temperature I achieved that way was 0.9 Kelvin. And, uh, but you can do, um, there's different types of refrigerators. You can do dilution refrigerators and things that will reliably get down below that. And so there are stages of cooling. And once you get to one level of cooling, then you can have that once that's stable, then you can have another part of the refrigerator cool from there down for a smaller region of the uh, instrument. Yeah, and I just yeah. mentioned, Gary, that's, that's a good, Go good, good critique of all that stuff. I was going to say, um, when I was doing my dissertation, I took my data at 20 millikelvin. And so we had to use that stage, that set of stages you, you talked about. And we actually built our own helium 3 4 uh, dilution refrigerators. Yeah. yeah. Another pretty, pretty neat cool. thing. <laughs> the, hey, um, Jerry, the all refrigerators Jerry, have. Oh, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say that this looks like. Say all refrigerators have a, a, what, what, a measure what? called the coefficient of performance. Um, and which is the amount of energy you have to put in versus the amount of energy you're pumping. And a uh, typical house refrigerator, that number is about four or five. So that's why you have to have several stages because you can't do it all in one stage. Right. You end up putting in just as much energy as you're trying to pump. Oh, huh. well, there's no. So, Tom, what was your question? I I'm wondering if this is actually really how, how it's built on, on the telescope. And it, like this tube would be no, the that secondary. Tube's not there. <laughs> you don't. You, you, well, I'm just thinking that maybe if this is the um, where oh, the image wow. comes in, and that this this really is part of the telescope where the the light comes through from the secondary mirror of the web and hits the the imager right here. Yeah, I'll go with every your question. So that's I'm just thinking that's what this really is. What's what the telescope looks like? It, oh, it, yeah, that's it's not the telescope. That's what the uh, sensor plane looks like. Right, the sensor. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so you think they're all st they're, they're linear, one and back of the other and back of the other? Yeah. The spacecraft. Mm -hmm. They had this turned off because up previously when the, the mirrors were being tilted and distorted and aligned, because this produces a vibration to it, which tells me that they've got um, Sterling cycle refrigerators as one of the stages on board, because mm -hmm. those produce a slight vibration. And that's so why they, they shut those they off when they're, they okay. shut those off when they're doing uh, f photography. I don't know. They would shut them off if they want to do something that requires it to be vibration free. So, forgive me for being simplistic, gentlemen, but isn't it pretty damn cold out there anyway? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yes. I, I heard the universe was basically what three degrees above Kelvin left. I, I think of it as four degrees, but it's three degrees will do. Three or four <laughs> zero and, and won't go there naturally. You need a uh, a fridge on board. It's well, we're going well, below that, Ron. Yeah, Ron. Yeah. I understand they asked that fellow you saw in the photo just a bit ago a boost in his paycheck if he'd accompany the web out there a million miles out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And it's now corkscrewing around the earth, or is it staying in place? I guess that's another part that we don't <laughs> Flying and it's flying around the sun in formation with the earth. Yes. Okay, a million miles, give or take. A few. Oh, out, then, yeah. it then it flies around the uh, L2 point. So when you look at yeah. it in a, in a fixed field, 
you see it wiggling back and forth because it's going around. It's got two different motions, the orbit around the L2 point and then combined with the orbit around the sun. Now, the, the, web, the instrument they're working on now is called the Mid-Infrared Imager. And the way that the JWST defines mid-wavelength radi radi IR is different than what we used to use uh, where I worked at Santa Barbara Research Center. Uh, for us, mid wavelength was about five to about four to six runs in wavelength. But, um, and that does not require these low temperatures. You can do that. Well, it depends on your detector. Um, but we had um, Mercat Telluride, for example, for a good detector there. But they're using extrinsic silicon, and it has to be much, much lower in temperature to get that to be a sensitive detector. And it's a detector for much longer wavelengths. So they're defining mid as a longer wavelength, somewhere around uh, 10 or 20 microns. Yeah, the reason they don't use uh, that kind of stuff here on Earth is you've got the water lines at around six gigahertz hmm. that uh, you know absorb. Is it still locked in on that star in tests? I don't know if they're still staring at that star or not. Well, I keep seeing YouTube videos that say it's just discovered oh something God. crazy in space. All that is lies, isn't it? Um, they haven't discovered anything yet. They haven't started their scientific mission. They're, they're, they've been going through the instruments one at a time and getting them each into operational mode and verifying that they work and calibrated. And I believe this is going to be the last one. Oh. So, they um, once they get through playing with this one, they should start their mission, which I think is about May or June, which is right on time. Yeah, well. YouTube is a swamp, Ron. Say again. YouTube is a swamp. <laughs> on it. That's the reason I bring oh, it. Oh yeah, they keep coming up with these things. Oh look at what uh, James Wolf just found, you know, and here's these uh, yeah. wonderful photographs. Well, they aren't there yet. There's, there's oh. no other way the, the <laughs> populace in our club, the members can watch us except for YouTube, I'm sorry to say. Interesting stuff. Okay. Well, as long as we're there, let's go to the cosmic milestone. Oh, all right. You mean uh, NASA confirming 5,000 exoplanets. My God. Yes. And there's a real cool video. If you will go to that, it's it's in the talking points, right? right above this um, picture you just put up. Yeah, oh, yeah. I think I had that somewhere. Here mm -hmm. we go. Yeah, we've seen this before. Yeah, let's hold on. Can we open it and make it move or is- He's gonna do yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> ah. So here's 1992, there's two exoplanets and go from there. And the web will be able to actually take pictures of them, right? Or do we need that block of the star, that little round sunflower in the distance? There's sound with it, too. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if the sound would come through. I'd have to. OK. Oh, it's, well, it's generally music. This just goes round and round and round. Well, the numbers are increasing. Yeah, the Kepler. Kepler did that. They have names for all of them? Well, I'm just talking about names. Telescope. Yeah. That way. Wow. Some of them they've actually given names. Have they? Well, in in the talking points, they talk about the one around uh, Pollux. Do you, do you suppose they found any orphan or rogue planets that don't have a star? We talked about yes. that a couple of weeks ago. Uh -huh. Good Lord. But they just pass through. They don't stay here. Well, just for life, huh, Chuck? And there we are, 5,000. There's quite a cluster over to the left of center there. That, that's where um, Kepler was staring. Yeah. yeah. That was a 360-degree view? Yeah, yes. this, this is the whole sky. I'll be damned. And that's the Kepler field of view, and they pretty much filled it with exoplanets. Yeah. <laughs> up, near, up in Cygnus, right, Chuck? Yeah, yeah, Lyra, Cygnus, that area, Summer yeah. Triangle. Mm -hmm. What is the so think about the same that uh, little 
cluster of density of light of pale blue light there distributed over the whole sky. That's probably how many you know exoplanets there are. If the Mm-hmm. satellite had stared at any other region, they probably would have found the same result. Yeah. So there's a lot of possibilities out there for planets. Yeah. And the distribution is shown in that picture that Tom just had up before this. About how these, what kinds of planets they are that we found. Mm-hmm. So you can see that 4% of them are terrestrial, that is Earth-like, small rocky planets. And it's not that that's that there's so few of them, it's that these are so hard to find. This, this pie chart represents the ease with which you can find them. Big, bright gas giants are easier, obviously. Super Earth, that's something that we don't have in our solar system. It's planets between Earth's size and Neptune's size. So if it's twice as big as Earth, it's a super Earth. And there are quite a lot of those out there. The big Neptune-like planets, the gas giant, or the ice giants, as they're called, there's a lot of those out there, too. Plus planets orbiting two stars at once. Uh, and initially, yeah. you know, the gas giants dominated because at first, you know, they were using the radial velocity method uh, instead of transits. And radial velocity is really makes these easy to find, the gas giants. So... <laughs> The first 300 or so pretty much were gas giants. Yeah, and surprisingly, Kepler had a small mirror, huh, Chuck? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. I remember reading someplace or that, uh, you know, some uh, extraterrestrials are defining our solar system and they see the gas giants and then there's some rocky debris that's further in. (laughs) Yep. One time, our Jupiter came in, didn't it? Did, don't they think that it migrated yeah. close to the sun? And these planets have moved around in our system, and we'll get to that with the largest comet in a few minutes. Oh, because that's got an interesting tail. But there's a lot of um, satellites going to be launched soon that are looking for improving the search for exoplanets. There's the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Well, that's up there now in 2018. James mm-hmm. Webb will uh, capture light from the atmospheres of exoplanets. And the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is expected to be launched in 2027. Is that the one that blocks out the star? No, that's no. not the super uh, leaf that they throw up there. Oh. There's also a mission called Ariel, which will be launched in 2029 to observe exoplanet atmospheres. If, if we detect oxygen, there's got to be life there, probably, right? I'm not so sure. Be. It's probable, but it's not. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, chemical processes that mimic uh, life processes. Uh, for example, the what was it? The uh, methane discovery on Mars. Um, seasonal methane, which is because methane is destroyed by um, ultraviolet light, and so the stuff that they get. A puff of it on Mars in the springtime. And he says, oh, that must be life there. But it could be volcano. There's other processes that will also generate methane. So there's nothing that's really airtight, no pun intended, um, proof of life that we've come across yet. There was a, one of our earlier rovers or Mars probes picked up clay and then or the remnants of old clay, and then it exposed it to nutrients and water, and they got uh, byproducts that were believed to be byproducts of microorganisms. But yeah. that, that has remained controversial. I believe that was in like 94 or 95 or something. It was 76. Was it 76? Okay. It was the Viking landers. Oh, right. 94 was that asteroid or the meteorite they found with um, fossilized worms in it, they thought. Right. That was actually Another, they found that, that meteorite in 84, but they didn't look at it for 10 years because they were finding so many down in Antarctica. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's another controversy that has added to the confusion. So, Jerry, in that the, the Viking that you say it actually had water on the that it carried along and, and added it to the, the dirt that they picked up. Wow, it basically that's had chicken soup that it added yeah. to the to the rocks and and to see what reactions it would get. Mm-hmm. Wow, but it cured the cold. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but somehow they're going to bring back this stuff, aren't they, in the future? They're, yeah, they're, and they got a rover up there now that's leaving, depositing these little um, ampules of Mars dirt. And there's another rover that's going to go up there shortly and scoop them all up and bring them back. On Mars, would that be a red rover? <laughs> <laughs> a good one. Thank you. <laughs> Incidentally, uh, Tom Whittemore will be appearing this weekend at the Comedy Store down in LA. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's more where that came from. <laughs> okay, 5,000 exoplanets. Well, incidentally, um, just let me plug our uh, Friday meetings, the first Friday of the month. The last two have been about exoplanets, and they're saved, are they not, Tom? Somewhere yes. on, on YouTube, or how do we save them? How can you watch them if you really want to learn about exoplanets? We had yeah, just, just go to the YouTube uh, channel. It's We call it SB Astro Unit, but uh, yeah, well, there's well, links on our webpage. On our web all right, it was just Friday, click on Friday, click on the pictures or yeah. Coming up uh, the first Friday of May, we're going to be talked about uh, from uh, a Caltech professor, uh, Dr. Ben Darvish, who's going to cover the evolution of galaxies. Yeah, interesting topic. Well, I don't know if we want to talk about the full moon. There's not a lot really going on. Here. Let's let's do the biggest comet because it segues <laughs> from the planet and formation oh, and planets moving around. Largest comet ever seen is on an orbital path. Uh, it's never going to be, be closer than a billion miles, I guess, or whatever, but it's going to swing inside our cosmic neighborhood. Yeah, it's going to stay outside the orbit of Saturn. Oh, really? But, uh, it, yeah, it's not. It's coming in. A, right now, it's doing about 22,000 miles per hour, and it uh, will accelerate as it comes in from the, from the outer reaches of the solar system. But this but, sector is twice the size of Rhode Island. Yeah. This is unusual in several things. It's it's 85 miles across, which is not terribly big for a, a body floating through our solar system, but it is a comet, which means it has a lot of volatile materials. It's leaving a tail and a coma and, and all this crap behind it. So it's becoming very active. It, it's kind of reminds me of if, um, a piece of Pluto with all its frozen nitrogen and stuff on it were to come in close to the sun closer closer to the sun, and it would do that too. It would start giving off all that gaseous stuff. And even at Pluto's distance, Pluto has an atmosphere when it's um, far away from the sun. Let's see, no, it has an atmosphere when it's closer to the sun, and the atmosphere freezes out onto the surface when it's farther away from the sun. So the, the weak sunlight even out there can cause some of these volatiles to become very visible, and that's what's happened with this comet, even though it's still a long ways out there. The interesting, there are many interesting things about this comet, but um, one of them is that this comet is believed to, through modeling, is believed to, um, oh, let me, there's, a, there's pictures of it, of what it looks like taken by the Hubble through observation. And then they did some computer modeling of it, showing the computer model and then subtracting out the coma and the tail so you can see the modeled. And they use that model to un. Uh, deconvolute the observation to see the, the nucleus. Um, this thing appears to have been, is believed to have been produced here in the inner solar system when the solar system was more populated with planets and before the planet moved around a lot and it was somehow flung out into the Oort cloud or the Kepler belt. Um, Kuiper belt. Now it's making its <laughs> Kuiper belt. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and now it's coming back again. Um, it formed apparently 4 billion years ago when the solar system was in its uh, early stages when it was just a baby. And it's not going to come any closer than the orbit of Saturn to the no. sun? No, it formed between Jupiter and Neptune, um, the theory is. And uh, it, as it came, it was gravitationally accelerated or slingshotted out of our solar system. Hmm. Hmm. If, you wanna, if you want to look up about that um, migration of the outer planets and, and tossing of this debris, it's it, the current best model is called the Nice model, N-I-C-E, because it was developed at the observatory there in Nice, France. Hmm. Okay. But you could call Pluto a comet. It, it comes within the orbit of uh, Neptune, doesn't it? 
Jupiter? What are you? Well, I'm talking Ron, about Ron, a comet just means that it's it's active and leaving a tail. Okay, yeah. and Pluto oh. doesn't do that. I guess. No. Uh, okay, the Saturn. I was just making an analogy with Pluto about how even the weak sunlight can excite um, frozen gases out at that distance. Oh. This one is not as far out as Pluto. It's much closer in, so the sunlight's warmer, but it has a lot of volatiles on it, and it's the sun is producing that tail with its with its gases. So the atmosphere forms the white patches on the surface of Pluto, and that explains that big heart-shaped thing that they yeah. saw. The New Horizons. Yeah, that's frozen nitrogen. Yeah. I thought maybe the definition of a comet is it came in close to the sun and. I guess even that far out, the sun. Makes a no, it's got to it's got to leave a tail a trail. Okay. It's got a a star. All right. So a comet is basically an asteroid with a lot of snow and water and ice on it, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, but twice the size of uh, Rhode Island would probably be about the size of uh, Connecticut, wouldn't it? Isn't Connecticut about? Size of two Rhode Islands. In I don't think Connecticut wanted any piece of this action. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you want to go back to the the Pan Stars, the other one that's uh, getting dimmer, Comet C twenty twenty one oh three. There's another comet reaching perihelion, the closest to our sun in its orbit this week, at according to the comet. I yes, with the full moon just passed last Saturday night, as someone pointed out earlier. Um, Pan stars will be a challenge. It's eleventh magnitude, and it's a fuzzy. Wow. And that's a horrible star chart. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chuck. <laughs> well, especially with our night skies. Yeah. Like I tonight, remember, it's going to be completely overcast. Ron, I remember Ron. looking at this and remembering that you objected to some of them, and I thought, oh, this can't be that bad. So, <laughs> so Ron, I'll recalibrate. A little tidbit on the full moon. So this is the first time since 1991 that Passover, Passover, Ramadan, and Easter happened pretty much the same weekend. It's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. The reason is an astronomical one. Yeah, it's the pl placing of the full moon with respect to the equinox. And the definitions of when those uh, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, I wonder how the guys that wrote the Bible placed Easter. Uh, on the full moon? Is that Easter's always on a full moon? That's no. why it's so called the, a Paschal moon, Ron. Right. So, hey, Ron, yeah. so, so the, the place the placement of Easter, which happens to be very, very late this year, has to do with when the vernal equinox happens, when the full moon happens after the vernal equinox, and then when that Sunday after the full moon happens. And it was this weekend. Well, I was born on an Easter Sunday, the 21st of April, back in the year I was born. So that's, that's about as late as it could be, I think. You know, it's, that's pretty late. You know? it just, it's, it's just strange. You think they'd use a date for the so-called, uh, you know, the, the rising of Christ to heaven or whatever, but it jumps around on the calendar. It, it, it had, yeah, it does jump around just because of the placement of the equinox, the full moon next, and then the Sunday after that full moon. Okay. Well, somebody brought me some chocolate eggs, and damn it, I'm eating them. <laughs> it's, religion. it's religion. It doesn't have to make sense. Yeah, I get it. Watch it, Chuck. <laughs> hey, we got a meteor shower, everybody. The Lyrids are here. Look out. The Lyrid oh. meteor shower. The peak this Friday, um, I guess it's underway for several weeks. We're going through the radiant. Mm -hmm. It rises later in the evening. Early morning might be the best time to catch the sizzling streaks in the sky, ladies and gentlemen, for us here in the oh, U.S. You're on that. Yeah, and also enjoy uh, the placement of Mars with Saturn and also then Venus and also Jupiter. So those four planets are in the early morning. Well, there were five yeah. at one time, weren't there, recently? Five yeah, the Mercury, Mercury is part of the evening. mix, that's true. But now Mercury is an evening thing. So you can actually, if you've got a good horizon right now, Mercury's going to put on quite a show this month. It's really nice. It, 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 after the sun goes down. Yeah. In, in, the, in the West. Chuck, why don't you like this kind of a design for the sun? <laughs> because it doesn't, it doesn't even come close to looking like what the sky would look like. It's just, it looks like somebody just spit a bunch of dots on there. <laughs> why do you suppose they don't just use a photograph of the sky? Yeah, I know. 
Okay. Nothing like Sky and Telescope, huh, Chuck? Yeah, Sky and Telescope does a much better job. Oh yeah, yeah, that's that is it. Yeah. Okay. And you can okay, I won't use this thing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'll use the Sky X. <laughs> All right, fantastic. You want to talk meteors? You want to talk about uh, Sirius blazing nose of Canis Major cluster M46 in Pupus, Puppus? All right. All right. Uh, after I think, Chuck, I think Chuck and Tim were on that on Friday night, huh, Chuck? I, I think Tim tried for it. I don't know okay. if he got it. Okay. But yeah, it's interesting because it has a planetary there, as, as we saw in one of those pictures that flapped by. There it is. There. there that's, it's really pretty with the filter. Mm -hmm. Oh, an oxygen filter. Yeah. Yeah. O three. Right. Yeah. Right here. Mm -hmm. But what magnitude is it? Can you see it visually easily? No. Oh no. Oh, it's, it's ninth or I mean, uh, what size telescope do you need to, to be able to see this? I've seen it. My eight inch homemade scope. Yeah, okay. it doesn't need to be too big. The O three mm -hmm. filter really brings it out. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a messy object, so you can see it in a in a three inch scope. But I don't no. know if you'll pick out the planetary. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me what we're looking at. Is that a, a star cluster? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it's M46 and the planetary that's in it. Oh, okay. Right. What is, what is Puppus? Puppus is, is the poop deck of Argo yeah. Navis. I say the stern, Chuck. Watch it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Young grouping of stars, Mag. Um, Magnitude six, barely visible to the undressed eye ball. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the planetary is not in the star cluster. The planetary is between the star cluster and us. That's right. Mm -hmm. There and it is. Visual superposition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, when you say planetary, that's a place that's a lot of gas and dust that can make planets, right? They're not. No. No, no. no. That's the end of life of a low mass star like the sun. Ah, yes. nothing to do with planets. Some stars opt for no nova. They just they just burp off the outer layers. And so we yeah. call them planetary. Yeah, because in the yeah. Earth telescopes, they weren't telescopes weren't that good. They were small and looked like uh, Neptune or Uranus might look. So they were yeah. called planetaries. Okay. I was gonna say the previous the previous um, star chart that Tom had up has has really nice line sec section for the the shape of a dog. You know, it's yeah. it's really Way they connect the lines it really does look like a dog <laughs> see it chuck how do you like a map like this white background okay. black stars this is much better yeah especially yeah. if you're out under the nighttime sky with a, right. a red red flashlight all uh, that yeah. red circle around m46 wouldn't right. show very well oh yeah and it's from sky and telescope as as That's tom right. uh, circled there yeah and the international astronomical union Right. Okay. The different size balls means the different size stars, I guess. No, no, the the brighter, they're, they're brighter. How bright they are. Right. The bigger is brighter, Ron. And you have the two brightest stars in the sky right there. Yeah. Isn't that pretty? There's Canopus and there's Sirius. Uh-huh. And the, the arcs represent uh, the curves of the sky. I, well, there's a grid up there. That's, that's right ascension and declination. That's mm -hmm. the coordinate system. Ah, uh, mm -hmm. gotcha. And, What's circled in red? What is that? That's M46. 46. The star cluster we were talking about, M46. Yeah, that's M46, Ron. I'll highlight it so you can find it. Also to the right, Ron, is M47, which is a really pretty open cluster. That one right there. I don't know, Tom, can you bring that one up uh, on the fly? M47? I, I'd have to go to... Uh... I, I don't want to put you out. I just, I just wondered, because that's a real pretty one. You could have edited that URL to change the number. Huh. M47. There's 47. Okay. Oh, it's got two little smiley asterisms there at the bottom. <laughs> one in blue and one in red. Yeah. You see there's a lot of stars that have gone into the, um, uh, you know, into the red face there. Hmm. Yeah. A lot of stars. The, the red giant face is what I meant, yeah. That, that's easily accessible through a small small uh, telescope too. Wow! So every white dot we're seeing, uh, no matter the size, is in the middle. No, 
of galaxies in the distance or anything in this? Perhaps. These are all all pretty much stars. Just all stars, Ron. Yeah, yeah. and I, I would just guess that this is probably two thousand light years away, just roughly. I'm not for sure. But, you know, these are bright stars. You couldn't see our sun like this if it were that far away. Well, apparently they're young. Sixteen hundred. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. Uh -huh. Fascinating stuff, gentlemen. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm, a lot. A lot of these. A lot of these little clusters out there in Cass Major are ballpark 2,000 light years. Wow, can't put my mind around that at all. Where's 46? What are we looking at, gentlemen? Where are you going, Tom? <laughs> I'm waiting, go ahead, go somewhere. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's go to, um, what is that? The moon left. Next uh, as a, we're, I guess it's on the waiting side now, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, let's go to 3115 in sextons. 3115 what? In sextons. Oh, oh yeah. I, I wanted to ask about that. Is it, um, uh, let's see. Sextons. I did write it all down. I just, is that the spindle galaxies? No, that's the that's, Oh yeah, yeah, spindles. There's a couple of spindle galaxies. So since the moon is waning, we don't get much rain here, but doggone it's waning outside. Moon appears a bit later in the evening, so use your time between sunset and when the Pascal, Pascal, is that a, is it a hard to say? Pascal. Pascal. <laughs> P-A-S-C-H-A-L. Or pink. Now, why pink? Does it show up pink, full moon? No. Okay. Oh, wow. It rises to focus on magnitude 9 NGC 3115. Sextons. In sextons. Sextons is a constellation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like with a T at the end? Sextons? Yeah, it means it's a sextant. It's a sextant, Ron. That, that's the measuring device. Mm -hmm. No, no. Okay. I didn't see the word anywhere inside the, uh, the piece of this. I saw it in the title, so it's the Spindle Galaxy. M102, it's also called... Oh, 31, 3115 is a single galaxy um, that I put in there a drawing that someone made through their six inch F8 Dotsonian. Nice. Of it. And so this is rather than show the photographs, which are always very pretty and I like to look at them, but they don't give you a sense of what you're actually going to eyeball in the telescope. So this, this was done by a person looking through his telescope and this is what he saw and he, and he drew it probably in the negative and then we flipped it in the computer. So this is a good idea of what you'll see in an average small telescope. Mm -hmm. And Ron, that M102 is another galaxy that's called the spindle galaxy. So this yeah. is- I realized that I didn't have a chance to correct that. So there's an NGC 3115 sextons. Yeah. Oh, no, sextons is just the constellation it's in. Yeah. All right. And why, why spindle? Is it supposed to look like a, is that, what a spindle looks like? No, yeah, it's Ed John. These, these names are just um, conveniences applied by the public. They're not official names. There's no real. It looks like that to some people, not to other others. Okay. The uh, constellation of sextons is so minor that it has no named stars in it. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it's also called Caldwell 53. The galaxy, yes. The galaxy is. Okay, and it's three degrees east of uh, magnitude five gamma sextanus, which is a star. Yeah. <laughs> Stars in our galaxy, that galaxy is way out beyond. Small galaxy, less or no. No named stars? No named stars. No. It's a pretty, pretty weak constellation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they don't even have numbers. You know, oh, they long, do. Long, yeah, long, they, they have numbers. Alpha, beta, sextans. Yeah. Oh, uh, all right. Oh. But all these, uh, like Alfred down in the lower right corner, um, they don't have any named stars like that. Yeah, Alfred is, is in, in Hydra. Right. Mm -hmm. Next mm -hmm. door. Yeah. So we name stars in other galaxies that somehow we see. Does Andromeda this have is, a... This is not in other galaxy. All the stars you see here are in our galaxy. All right. right. Yeah, run. We can't see with our eyes stars in other galaxies. The stars that have names are the stars that you can see naked eye. Yeah. Right. 
Well, if you haven't heard, they say, uh, I just read and you uh, verified it last week that they've just seen the farthest star away. I guess it's uh, doing a lens thing around. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They, one, they give special ones like that a name, but that's not one that has a traditional name, which were only ones you could see with your eyes. Yeah. Well, here's, uh, here's quoting your talking points. A small galaxy and lesser known constellation has no named stars. Right. So mm -hmm. this constellation doesn't have stars, not the galaxy. I got yeah, it. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Uh, okay, fascinating. There's lots of galaxies without stars, but you can't see them. Yeah. Does anybody, <laughs> anybody know how a sextant works? Yeah. Yes. yes. That little triangular thing with the arc <laughs> bottom where you point at the sun. Every you get two oh, images. Yeah. They have a split mirror. You look at the horizon on one and you look at the object that you want on the other and it tells you the degrees above the horizon that it exists. Well, I it's an that. old that instrument. It's an old instrument. Still works well. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah, I had to learn celestial navigation in the Navy. Yeah. Wow. You suppose Columbus had one of those? Or is someone, that someone on a ship had one. Yeah. And they could tell where they were out in the Atlantic. Well, the big problem yeah. is that uh, time. You can get latitude quite easily. In fact, just shoot local at apparent noon. But uh, longitude, you actually need to know right. time accurately. And the right. time where you came from. Yeah. Right. You need yeah, and Columbus wouldn't have had a sextant with the little telescope like the current ones. Because <laughs> that's, right. Right. That was, that's a couple of hundred years later, or a yeah. hundred years later. But yeah. it is a telescope. It does magnify what it sees. Right. He would have had an astrolab, which is like a a simpler, well, it, it looks more complex. It's a version that shows positions of all kinds of stars. You can see some down here below. Um, they have what's called a wreath there or a, or a you know, a, a complex looking sequence of pointers mm -hmm. that you set certain stars on. Like come up, Tom, to the top row and, and the, like the one, two, three, four, fourth and fifth from the left. Mm -hmm. Like there, that's an astrolab. Okay. Looks like a pendant. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, it is a pendant. It's got a little ring on it. Yeah. Okay. And today we use GPS. Yep. So those aren't, those are relics. Actually, I heard from, from someone who was a navigator in the Air Force that they've totally done away with navigators uh, to save money on, you know, some of the larger aircraft that go out. They just rely on GPS because they have multiple systems. Mm -hmm. it seems at least for a while they did that. I think they might have realized that wasn't a good idea and gone back. Do you suppose an Alexa or a Siri talks to the pilot? <laughs> like for a turn no, probably just a readout. Yeah. Well, all those truckers on 101 are being told to get off at 154, and so the pass is full of big trucks. Uh, Shortest route. Look at this. I was just going to mention that, you know, Tico Bra, uh, who was doing a lot of work on Mars, uh, before the telescope uh, had a basically a room size, you know, version of a sextant that he, you know, he had uh, done sightings on Mars. It wasn't really called a sextant, but it was a, a really nice device that he used. I don't know, Tom, if you could bring up Tico Bras. Oh, we're called quadrants. Yeah, quadrants yeah. muralis, the wall size quadrant. So it was yes, a quadrant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's one of those that, uh, uh, Come on, the, the observatory in England, Greenwich. Really? Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. That looks like a crossbow. Yeah, yeah. Tom, bring up um, Urania Borg. Yeah. Or, um, you know. The one with the dog in it, Chuck. Yeah, Tico's <laughs> Observatory. You, you'll get this, this Quadrans Muralis. There was even a constellation named after it that's over where Boates is now. And mm -hmm. that's where you get the quadranted meteor shower. Mm-hmm. Urania Borg, uh, uh, put a put a B O R G on the end. Butterflies, angels. What the heck is this? Okay, and when there's look for an interior picture, and you'll see the the quadrant mural. Up in the field where you put the word, row, Tom. Good. It was in the second row of his original. Jeez. Uh, Amazing devices. It's, it's a famous picture, and it shows yeah, him pointing up at the second sky. Row, second row, third from the right. Second row, third. 
That one. There it right is. There. Yeah. And there's a doggy in it. Yeah. There is. So uh, many years ago, when I was going to an astro camp down in Tucson uh, for teachers, there was a girl who won. There's always a portion for high school students, and she won uh, an entry to the um, to, to the, uh, the the telescope complex up in Tucson by talking about making up a story about what Kepler's dog. I'm sorry, what Tico Bryce's dog told him. It was pretty cute. <laughs> You're going to have to explain to me, Tom, who Tycho Brahe is. What the heck is that? Tycho he, Brahe. He's a Brahe. Danish yeah, astronomer. Danish. Tycho. Mm -hmm. He was Danish? He was an astronomer mm -hmm. before telescopes, but had very accurate data. Yes. And he had a brass nose. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> His name was spelled T-I-K-O? T-Y-H-O. T-Y. -H -O. T -Y. Yeah, it, was just, it was just there. Oh, I've seen that. Okay. I didn't realize yeah. that it was pronounced. Okay. Fascinating. But yeah. he's the one that uh, basically Ke Kepler took a lot of this data, you know, and then started founding the, you know, the three laws of motion and things like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His data was so accurate at a time when people were just using their eyeballs, not telescopes, that uh, yeah. Yeah. Kepler was able to figure out elliptical there, orbits from that. There it is. What is the big arc in that picture about? That's the quadrant. That's yeah. a quadrant. He sights off of that, Ron. It's it's graduated in degrees from zero to or from zero to ninety degrees, and mm -hmm. it measured the position of the star as it as it passed the meridian. You can see the guy, a in red in the, roof. Over there. the guy in red over there is sighting up at looking at a star. Mm -hmm. Through a telescope, not through no, no, no telescope. No telescope. No telescope, then, Ron. Not yet. Just like gun sights. Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. Somebody actually painted this, or I, it's, that looks like a painting. Yeah. It yeah, is a painting. painting. Yes, it is. Yeah. Paint a photograph. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no kinescopes yet that early, right? Yeah. See the dog. See the dog sitting on the floor yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Board with the whole thing. Directly below it is a layout of his observatory. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and unfortunately, that's long gone, that whole yeah. observatory complex. Mm -hmm. Although they built kind of a replica on the ruins of it, and you can visit it. Mm -hmm. It's on an island called Havane. Mm -hmm. And one bad, really bad pun I've heard is that... Um, you know, Tico was on Havane and did all this data, but then he moved to Czechoslovakia mm -hmm. and he died. But Kepler was able to use his data so he didn't die in Havane. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty corny. Yes, that's <laughs> but good. Was any of this stuff accurate that they found? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kepler, Kepler saw the pattern in the data and he derived his three laws. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. In about three minutes. What yeah. Are you at? Uh, Jim Williams says tonight there's a, canceled. There you yeah, go. tonight's pretty much a goner, I think. They're going to be yeah. crowded out up there, and I'm, I'm going to just go up with meteorites. Okay. I don't, I'm not going to go. You have your five pounder and you still know that soliloquy about the older than dirt and made it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so I used, the used it again at Westmont on Friday. Yeah, okay. All right. Sorry. Oh, yeah. um, I ran this by everybody, uh, Mr. President, last week and you weren't on board, but you were listening. Maybe you heard you were on I 5, I think, uh, tuned into us. Yeah. On cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, I ran into something uh, called. Um, uh, centrifugal force versus centripetal force. Have you heard yeah. of it? Oh, yeah. It's, it's fundamental physics. High school physics goes over that in detail. Okay. We can talk about that next time. I'll prepare yeah. a paragraph on it. I'd love That'd be, to fun. That'd be fun, Jerry. Supposedly yeah. the moon, I think, is in centripetal force or centripetal yeah. or whatever. It's, it's like I was a thinking that for one of our future things, we might do a history of the telescope. Uh, it, it would be a long topic. It would be a single topic discussion. Yeah. And Tim so Crawford think, would like that a lot. Okay. Yeah. So would Tom. Sure. Oh, okay. So <laughs> I'll, I'll write up an outline and um, everybody can pitch in their yeah. 75 cents. 
So Ron, Ron that yeah. word is, is, is pronounced centripetal. It means center seeking, center seeking. Center seeking. And supposedly the moon is involved in that sort of a force or a situation. Yeah, the cent centrifugal force is a force and it depends on your um, um, frame of reference. Your frame. It, it's your frame, yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, to me, it's, a, it's, it's just a frame force. And right. It's, well, it's, it's going to give us our, our fake <laughs> gravity in the future on board spaceships, isn't it? Centrifugal? That, that's centrifugal. Yeah. Oh, is that how it's pronounced? Centrifugal? Well, yeah. I was just making it obvious which one I meant. <laughs> it means running away from the center. All like right. Well, I, I, fugue. I look like forward fugitive. to the great presentation yeah. for uh, uh, austere Mr. President. And I guess <laughs> we'll uh, conclude the program unless anybody else uh, wants to plug something. Uh, anything? Well, coming up, Astronomy Day, May 7th at Camino Real Marketplace. May nice. 15th, total lunar eclipse at Camino Real Marketplace, plus okay. second Saturday at the museum, third Friday at Westmont, and Telescope Tuesdays, first Tuesday of the month. And the first Camino Friday, Real Marketplace. Uh, our guest will be uh, 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 Mr. Dervish, Dr. Dervish, Darvish, I guess is his yeah. name. Thank you, uh, so, Joe. So, uh, all masked, right? All masked events. So yeah. far, yeah, the museum still okay. requires us when dealing with the public to be masked. Okay, okay. Okay, I've had a stall on my vetting, incidentally, online. Maybe I'll talk to Tom or one of you guys about something I ran into, but it's okay. I want to get vetted. So I, this one, I think I'm all right. I'm in my own home, so I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Guys, thank you. Give uh, my love to your wives, and I uh, can't yeah. wait until we all get, a, get together again, and we'll do it online next week for number 61. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it for the SBAU Astro Hour. Right. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay. Thanks, Thank Rob. So, sorry, right. I didn't get to a lot of comments. Check out the comments on the YouTube channel that people made tonight. Okay. Today. All right. Okay. See.